Good evening. It's actually nice to see faces out here this evening. So uh, thank you for joining us for our meeting. Uh, we are each at an eight-foot table, so we are social distant. So uh, we're going to do our talks at this time. And if you feel comfortable in the audience, then uh, we will socially distance. And just make sure if you do stand up, you put your mask back on. <coughs> Again, welcome. And uh, we are going to uh, have our Pledge of Allegiance. Present. Mr. Lockhart. Here. Ms. Lauer. Present. Dr. Bowers. Present. Mr. Scott. Here. Mr. Wise. Present. Mr. Berg. Present. Again, thank you to everything, everyone for attending tonight, especially I'm feeling the pressure since Dr. Bowler is actually here tonight watching. <laughs> to our vision, mission, and core values. Our vision is working together with our community. We inspire our students to discover their talents and rise to their greatest potential. Our mission is building on the strengths of our diverse community to create an engaging, comprehensive, educational environment that supports the growth of lifelong learners. Our values are we are committed to always asking and answering what is in the best interest of each student. Leading by example, we are committed to personal accountability and work habits, honesty and respect. We are committed to a safe, secure, and welcoming environment. We are committed to practices of inclusive excellence that value differences. We are committed to respecting the voice of all district stakeholders through collaborative engagement. And we are committed to developing students who improve the quality of life for the Wabash Valley. Before we move on to the consent agenda, I just want to make one note about the consent agenda. Uh, the permission for the marching band uh, to go to Florida and Walt Disney World, that's obviously pending things being open, travel being safe. Uh, there's lots of pendings on that one. All the daughter clerks there. You so. have no idea how many pendings <laughs> there are on that. So just, just note that on the consent agenda, that that is pending everything being acceptable for them to go there at the time. And do I have a motion for the consent agenda? Second. Mr. Burks made the motion to approve. Dr. Powers seconded that. Dr. Davis made the Mr. roll call. Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Welcome Powers? Aye. Enter the meeting and followed by the town committee. Ms. Scott? Aye. Ms. Wise? Mr. Burke. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. You are joining us all with more than a pool of people here. Please use your phone. <laughs> all right. So do we need to wait on everybody before we move on to the next one? So our accounts payable docket is the finance committee. So we met on Friday, and that was uh, Mr. Lockhart, Ms. Scott, and myself. And uh, we met with the finance department, the business department. Questions were sufficiently answered. Would you say so, Mr. Lockhart, Ms. Scott? Yes. Yes. Okay. So moving on with our uh, finance committee accounts payable docket, I would entertain a motion. So moved. I'll second. Ms. Wise made the motion to approve. Mr. 
Lau is seconded that. Ms. Jeff Irwin. Aye. Mr. Lockhart. Aye. Ms. Lauer. Aye. Dr. Powers. Aye. Ms. Scott. Aye. Mrs. Wise. Aye. Mr. Burke. President, members of the board of administration uh, seeks approval uh, to accept various donations for the backpack fund. As reported at our last board meeting, we have received overwhelming support to help feed our children. Tonight, we look to accept donations from Sarah Scott Middle School and Terre Haute Union Optimus, but they also represent the dozens of others received uh, since the last time. Lauer made the motion to approve. Mr. Lockhart seconded that. We have a roll call, Dr. Hayward. Mr. Irwin. Aye. Mr. Lockhart. Aye. Ms. Lauer. Aye. Dr. Powers. Aye. Ms. Scott. Aye. Mrs. Wise. Aye. Mr. Burks. Aye. Again, just so grateful. Challenge. Um, I think our new optimist uh, was a $4,000 donation. Uh, our Teachers Association now on three different occasions have contributed to the Backpack Fund. Just various groups throughout our community stepping up and uh, making sure that um, especially the weekend meals are being covered. Still me uh, under uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, I'm making the recommendation that we accept the personnel report and professional leave request as presented. I so move approval. Second. Mr. Lockhart made the motion to approve. Excuse me, Dr. Powell. Adoption for special education. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Very good. My name is Ruth Tobias. I'm the assistant director. Thank you for having me uh, with Covered Bridge. And uh, we are here to make recommendations for special education students in the, the areas of language arts and literature. Uh, as you can see from the outline in your packet, uh, the committee has recommended that we use the same textbooks for students that are on a diploma track that Gen Ed has adopted. And then we have also recommended some intervention products for those struggling students, as well as our students who are assessed with the alternate assessment. Uh, the committees of the special ed uh, group attend the same caravan as the Gen Ed, and they also explore other alternative products that we're familiar with because of the students that we serve. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you don't have any, then we respectfully ask that you approve the textbook recommendations as outlined in your packet. Thank you. Any questions from the board before she's done on her call? Do I have a motion? I so move. Second. Mrs. Lauer made the motion to approve. Ms. Scott seconded that. Can we get a roll call, please, Dr. Hayward? Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks? Aye. Thank you. Dr. Goller, it's good to have you with us tonight with the English Language Arts electives adoption. Thank you, President Irwin, Superintendent Hayworth, and members of the board. Tonight we bring you an administrative summary 
for English Language Arts. Last month, we brought you the information for the regular language arts, the 6 through 12, what students have in the core curriculum. And tonight, we bring you the elective information. So the information you see in front of you would include the uh, semester classes that are electives. Many of these, as you see, uh, film literature, children's literature, women's literature, classical literature, sports literature, ethnic literature, Holocaust literature, are some of the themed courses. We don't offer each one each year, but sometimes we, we have those uh, every other year. So that way we can have uh, full class loads and uh, students can have a variety of electives each year. So um, teachers met with the committees and looked at what kinds of materials they thought best would uh, help students uh, learn that material in interesting and engaging ways and they came up with these selections. We also supplement these with novels that are in our uh, IMC. So this is what we have available tonight and would ask for your approval for these one semester electives. So moved. I'll second. Mr. Burks made the motion to approve. Mrs. Lauer seconded that. Can we get a roll call please? Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks. Aye. And I'd like to thank Janet Rosemer. She's our curriculum coordinator and her committee for the work that they did to prepare these novels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kohler. Okay, moving on, it looks like we have grants and the co-curricular presentation. Do we want to do those separately or together? We'll do them together. Okay. Uh, I think we need thank you, Bill, for wiping off the we're trying to establish safe practices so we're pausing between so that we can wipe down the podium so we'll uh, apologize Hank I, we'll do them together if that's okay with you Doug okay. thank you Superintendent Hayworth President Irwin Board of School Trustees it is my pleasure tonight to bring forward both the adult education grant and the um, Carl D. Perkins grant. First, the adult education grant is a uh, grant that is partially formula-based and partially performance-based. And it's my pleasure to announce that our allocation, which is $349,699, is a slight increase. A um, little bit about where those funds will go is um, for adult basic education, we operate 10 different sites in our community. In workforce education, we have two extremely strong and popular programs going right now. One is a CDLB program, which is near and dear to our heart as a school district because it also helps um, qualify school bus drivers. So we can actually hire those people. And then um, auto service electronics, um, we've been working through the different auto service ASC programs and those are people that are currently employed at different dealerships and we're helping increase their skills. And then that's on the workforce side and then integrated education and training. Um, one of the neat new programs we launched with um, Union Hospital is a uh, serve safe certification and that's just to bring their skill level up and we just it was a pilot this year and we're hope to expand it next year of course then we work with community corrections which includes the juvenile center and jails and uh, we got to um, explore distance education for the first time um, <clears throat> this spring starting in march um, like many so um, that that's basically our adult education program then with Perkins, it is formula-based, and census data is, of course, very important to the Perkins grant. Um, so everyone, please do their census data for our community. Um, and then later in the year, we do get performance funds, but that's not in these, uh, this. We did lose a little bit of funding because our community is shrinking, but we're at $315,442.74. This is the first year of the new Perkins, or what um, we call Perkins Five, 
And um, there are four main categories that the committee broke it into. One is agriculture. So we're making a substantial investment in bringing agriculture career pathways in, which includes paying a percentage of teacher salaries. And what that does is help the school district um, not carry the load of a teacher salary that first year while um, kids getting in the class helps generate money because our classes generate money. So by using Perkins funds, it makes it so um, we don't have to carry the load. And we also um, have funds written in to help buy equipment and supplies the um, first several years. Um, and then we'll stair step down that salary and eventually um, it'll hopefully be self-sustaining the number of kids in there will help offset the teacher salaries. Um, number two is uh, manufacturing related persistence and basically anything that ties to manufacturing, um, it, we're working to improve the persistence. That means kids staying in those pathways and you people think of advanced manufacturing machine stuff but they don't think of uh, pathways like computer programming and, and we're also trying to improve the persistence in those pathways because manufacturing needs those two to be successful. Um, so the persistence in those pathways is a big focus. Then student engagement is a big focus um, and pathways like education professions, construction trades. Our construction trades is doing really great. We're actually turning kids away, but Clay County we're working to build enrollment. We are over Clay County also with this grant. And then team development um, and, and health careers is a big one. We're trying to expand even more and, and meet um, more diverse needs in health careers. And then in administration, we're using a portion of that. And this was actually Superintendent Hayworth's idea um, to improve the web, uh, section of the website so it's more user friendly for parents that they'll be able to click on the pathways and see all of our information, kind of like our learn to earn catalog, except for really more robust. So we're real excited about that. We hope to have it done within a year and Bill's helping with that. So that's the Perkins grant um, for this next year. So that's the two grants that we bring to you um, tonight for approval. I'll answer any questions if you have them. Did you want to vote on the grant separate from the return of money? That was my question. No, yeah, I, I think we can do them at the same time. Okay. All right. Just making sure we're on the same page there. I make a motion to approve the okay. grants. We need to. Oops. Dr. Hayward, did you want to do the co curricular oh, presentation? Okay. No, we'll do co curricular. Thank you. Mrs. Wise made the motion to approve. Mr. Lockhart seconded that. Can we get a roll call on the grants, please? Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks? Aye. Thank you. All right, now we're ready for Dr. Balatavich. Good evening, Superintendent Irwin. Ours. <laughs> I messed that up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Congratulations on the promotion, though. Uh, yeah. President Irwin, Superintendent Hayworth, members of the School Board of Trustees. Tonight, I would like to present to you the reentry plan for extracurricular and co-curricular activities, which is uh, included in your board packet this evening. This plan was created in accordance with the guidance provided by the Indiana Department of Education and the Indiana High School Athletic Association. We have solicited input from coaches, teachers, principals, and athletic directors to create our guidance, which mirrors state guidance in many respects. Most importantly, we have received valued input from the health department, and the greater medical community on best practices for this reentry plan. Essentially, this plan will begin on July 6th in phase one and July 20th in phase two. The plan focuses on four main pillars, teaching of the plan, 
training of staff and students, mitigation to stop the spread of the virus, and monitoring students and staff. At this time, I'll entertain any questions. I know the answer to this question, but you have worked with the health department closely in creating this plan, and uh, they are supporting of it, correct? Correct. We've had two very extensive meetings with the health department, uh, not only the health department, but the greater medical community uh, in-depth meetings and sought and accepted their direction. Thank you. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion still going on as far as the implementation of all this, and um, I just hope that there's a real cooperative spirit uh, among the students, as, um, as I know there will be among the staff. So it's, um, it's a challenge. Yeah, I know Dr. Dr. Mason. Oh, I'm sorry. I know Dr. Mason is working very closely with principals and athletic directors, coaches, to make sure that the implementation of this is highly effective. Have there been any discussions? So some of the th things such as you know, washing the uniforms nightly would be difficult for those who have no access to laundry. Um, different ways to help those who are, are more vulnerable to and challenged. You know, and I think we have discussed that, and we're going to have to monitor that situation very, very closely, but I'll note that uh, of the hate, concern. hate to exclude them from participating just because of lack of access to those. I agree. To, to that specific question, if, if some sports, uh, you laundry yourself. Right. Some sports, you laundry within the uh, team aspect of that. I do know that that is, is debated right now. I think currently, as we look towards July 6th, it would be you are laundering your own clothes at this point. And I think we'll reinforce to our coaches, however, if they do notice somebody that isn't taking care of that, that we try to address that. A in the nightly trip to the laundromat may not be possible for everybody. Any other questions for Dr. Malatavich? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mrs. Wise made the motion to approve. Dr. Powers seconded that. Can I get a roll call, please? Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayworth. And whenever you're ready, you can start your financial and enrollment update. I would ask the board if they would position themselves where they might be able to see the screens. <coughs> realizes that the last several weeks we've been giving a enrollment update um, we're going to add we're going to add to that a little bit in that we're going to talk a little bit about enrollment finances uh, that would then lead us into how we once again as uh, we have done over the last two years begin to engage our community about uh, important topics. Um, so for those that uh, attended many of the referendum meetings, uh, this uh, slide should be familiar except we've added to it. You can see where enrollment was at the fall of 2017. We've discussed this um, 
several times, we are declining in student enrollment. If you would fast forward to the fall of 2019, in our September count, you see that we uh, reported 14,185 students. In our spring count, which was in February, we reported to the board that number at 13,962. We took a June count, that's something that we typically don't do, but we're very interested in where student enrollment is. And we knew that in uh, May it declined, in April it declined. Right now we are at 13,600 22 students. If you think about a five-year average on enrollment, it would be our hope that we would bounce back to somewhere in the 14,125 range. I want to be very conservative with this presentation tonight because of many unknowns that uh, affect enrollment, and that will ultimately affect our finances. Also, you should note that that 13,622 could be kindergarten students that we have yet to enroll. So, as I present that information, please think of those uh, assumptions that we're making. So, where will enrollment be? Well, historically, you can see that we've bounced back and forth between a fall count and a spring count, recovering a little bit each year. It's our hope that we still recover this year, but it is an, un an unknown. COVID-19 costs. How's it going to affect operations? How's it going to affect uh, the health of our students, our staff, and the things that we're going to need to provide? Substitute employees and staffing concerns throughout the virus. We do believe that there could be some savings, and that savings might be in the area of field trips or travel. You think about currently, um, we have said that in 2020 we are not purchasing buses. Well, those buses just took a three month vacation. So, might we think about additional savings and property tax distribution? I think this board was forward thinking when they asked for a tax anticipation warrant against what we might see as a decline in property taxes. Happy to say that that really didn't materialize in the first uh, property tax installment to us. Our community stepped up to the plate and uh, we received nearly uh, the proportion that was allocated to us. But we don't know what the effect that will have in the fall. So uncertain about several things going into this school year and how we finish the 2020 year and how we enter into the 2021 year. In the face of this uncertainty, we're going to provide two different scenarios. One I would call the worst case scenario, and the second is a moderate scenario. Worst case is we don't bounce back from the 13622 that we currently stand in June. Moderate scenario is 13962, which was our February count. And again, not being an alarmist, we have exceeded that count each fall, but we are indefinitely uncharted waters. I would also remind you that the count last September was 14,185. So please keep that in the back of your mind. 
So if we think about the difference between the severe scenario and the modern scenario, you can see what it does to the uh, education cash fund balance at the end of this calendar year. So remember, each fall and each spring, we count our students. We receive funds from the state of Indiana for those students. And we're projecting in the worst case scenario to the moderate case scenario, difference of 340 students, but an impact on our bottom line of just over $1 million. And that is the education fund. That's just part of our cash balance, not the whole. The other part is our operations fund, which right now we are projecting it at $6.8 million. But we need to remember some things. Remember, we didn't buy any buses in 2020. We normally do. And so that's saving us approximately $2 million. What's not included in that $6 million figure is the sale of the admin building. And again, the uncertainty of property tax distribution in the second half of the year. So worst case scenario, if you think about the education fund and the uh, operations fund, we end the year at just under 12 million, which is what we forecasted to the community during the referendum. On the moderate scenario, we end at just over 13 million, and we did give that window of between 12 and 13 million. So you can see how enrollment really affects these scenarios. And again, what's not included in there is the $3 million sell of the uh, admin building. When I look at that, um, we may have thoughts of, well, Rob, that's not so bad. We hit our targets. Well, again, we're in July and we're projecting towards Dece December 31st, so still a lot of way to go. And remember, our enrollment is shrinking. So this is not gloom and doom, but I don't want us going out and thinking that the challenge is over. Remember, if we pull the purchase of those uh, the, of the school buses out of this scenario, that drops by $2 million. But we still have work to do. That scenario also demonstrates a reduction through attrition and retirement of 20 teaching positions. What this represents is our debt service and our tax rate for that debt service. And what is in front of you uh, are obligation bonds. What's in front of you is the aquatics center and estimated tax rates. And you can see in 2020, I bet, I bet I think it is the end of this month. The aquatic center is paid for. I think you can see a general obligation bond that we did in 2017 that is also concluded. You can see in 2021 a general obligation bond for 2018. 
and 2019. What I want to demonstrate there is that we have room to do more general obligation bonds. And when we think about our budget, we always have to remember this. Tax cap circuit breaker loss, which affects operations, which historically has affected bus transportation, bus replacement, capital projects. And so beginning in 2017, we started a cycle of general obligation bonds really to assist us in doing some things where we could not do them uh, through uh, what I would no longer call traditional means because this has been in place since 2010. But what we couldn't do with operations, um, transportation, bus replacement. So short-term, low-interest bond financing will allow us to do some things. And tonight, I'm going to make a recommendation that we hold a hearing for a general obligation bond. In that, it will be a $5.35 million GO bond for traditional things, roofing, maintenance, HVAC, and paving but it also includes $2 million for Chromebooks for grades three through seven, which will complete the administration of Chromebooks for all students. We just ordered, and that order will be in in August for our high school Chromebooks and eighth grade Chromebooks. It will, this GO bond will allow us to do three through seven with those Chromebooks arriving in what we believe is September. Also, when we think about debt service and how much is falling off, we would like to eventually talk to you about a potential larger project for Otter Creek Middle School which would be a renovation project to that building, as well as a 5.6 potential 2021 GEO bond so that we can maintain a, maintain a consistent tax rate in our debt service. So tonight, uh, for the board, I'm going to be asking, requesting, Approval to publish a notice for a public hearing for a 2020 general obligation bond of uh, 5,350,000. That hearing would take place at our regularly scheduled board meeting in July, which is July 13th. This would be the fourth in a series of short-term bonds issued since 2017. Bonds strategically issued to offset circuit breaker loss. Past GO bonds have been used to improve and maintain facilities and support curriculum. These potential projects would be HVAC, paving, roofing, and now you can see what we want to do with the Chromebooks for grades three through seven. Reminder that in this calendar year, we pay off two bonds, 2014 and 2017. Debt uh, retirements provide us with capacity right now to issue the proposed 2020 GEO bonds without adversely affecting the tax rate. If granted permission to hold the public hearing, Baker Tilly, our financial consultants, will have representatives here on 713 to provide more detail on the long-range strategic plan regarding debt and tax rate. So at this time, Mr. President, members of the board, the administration seeks approval in requesting permission to authorize publication of notice of a July 13th hearing for the 2020 general obligation bond. you get back to your seat. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit more of a workout here than it is. I need my steps today. 
Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Hayward. We appreciate the time and effort that you and your team put, to, put into putting that together for us. And do I have a motion to approve the uh, publication? I so move approval. Second. Mr. Lockhart made the motion to approve. Dr. Powers seconded that. Can I get a roll call, please? Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hayworth. This time, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Bill Payne to the podium to give us a presentation from Fanning Howie on the new virtual community meeting format. President Irwin, Dr. Hayworth, members of the board, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, early in March, uh, we sent everybody in our three offices home, just as you all have done the same thing with your school children. And we very quickly uh, uh, moved towards video conferencing as our uh, tool of choice to communicate with each other as we were working on project work, both with clients as well as with con uh, constructors and so forth. Uh, a key part of what we do in development of projects is community engagement because uh, it probably would surprise you to know that typically projects start out with a lot of unknowns and uncertainty as to the scale, scope, and the type of project that's necessary. And so boards are very interested, of course, in learning what your patrons have to say about that and what they feel is important, what they feel is valuable from a community standpoint. Uh, we've been averaging somewhere in the neighborhood of between 40 and 50 Zoom conferences uh, every week, so we are a power user. And as a result, uh, we've been finding a number of different tools that are available to us and, in fact, replicate to a great degree exactly the way we conduct community engagement and with the ability to have a controlled venue online electronically and to gain input from the community, from the participants uh, in real time in a number of different ways. Uh, so that's what we're going to show you here this evening. So I'm just going to touch base. Megan, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Great, fantastic. So, uh, Bill, Megan. I, Bill, if I might, can yes. you speak into the microphone? Please? Absolutely, yes. So, Megan uh, Keller is in our Indianapolis office. Well, actually, she's at home right now, but uh, she's in our Indianapolis office, and she is our host for this evening. Uh, so, one of the questions you might ask as we start to move into this presentation is, what type of controls are available uh, to this? And so I want to say this is a very controlled environment that our host or host uh, control entirely and allow folks to interact or not as the case may be. Now at this point, what we know is that with this particular tool, we can invite up to 300 participants, which is pretty substantial. And in fact, we are hopeful that the use of this tool will enable us to conduct community engagement and involve more patrons uh, because now folks can do this from the comfort of their own home. It's rel relatively intuitive. Uh, and will allow them in three different ways to input uh, during the process. So what you're seeing here is a splash page which is just identifying the demonstration. This will be your community engagement, so as we move towards that, what you'll see is that we'll take on the Vigo County Vigo team uh, format. As we go through this, by all means, feel free to just ask me questions at any time about the process we're walking through here. Now, typically, a community engagement meeting might last anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes. We will not be taking 90 minutes tonight. I see lots of smiles. I'm sure you're glad of that. So this is a very compressed presentation, but I just want to give you a sense of the types of things that we can do within the context of this presentation. So let's uh, jump right in. Now, typically, I would actually be within the Zoom conference just for this evening so that I can be here. I'm actually outside of it. So in that case, uh, Megan and I may be actually sharing the controls. So occasionally, it may seem like we're a little bit lag time in terms of slide transition, but not a big deal. So obviously, 
we would be going out to the community and using this to have a discussion about the high schools and what the vision, uh, what the desire of the community would be for the future of those high schools. And obviously, as you know, uh, together we've been working on those through a feasibility study and through a condition assessment, phase one condition assessment following up. So that would really be the meat of this subject. Uh, you clearly would be participants, so typically Dr. Hayworth would probably do a lot of the introductory statements of uh, representing the school corporation and providing some background uh, to the overall presentation. So continuing on. So here's the goals for community input sessions. We want to involve as many individuals as possible. And as I said, uh, we can involve at this point, we believe, up to 300. And in fact, we may be able to expand that number. Uh, this can be recorded. So this can be shown again at any time. So as you all know, typically community engagement happens in the evening. Well, there are ball games, all kinds of other family activities that take place that often preclude the participation. This can be recorded and then viewed by uh, patrons at any time during the day or the weekend. We want to inform participants of the condition of the high schools, the need, and the costs associated with those potential options. As you all know, there are eight options that are being considered at this point for the high school facilities. Uh, clearly, we want to receive as much feedback as possible and position administration to make a recommendation on the four best options from those eight by September of this year. Again, we'll proceed to seek additional feedback on those four remaining options and hopefully get to the point where a best option out of those four can be recommended by the end of this year. Okay? So we'll give everybody a sense, all the participants of the agenda. And by the way, I mentioned this is a controlled environment, so as everybody is invited in, everybody comes into the Zoom conference, they will be muted. They'll be able to see the full proceedings and, and hear everything that's taking place, but they will not be able to speak until we give them the opportunity to, and you'll see that in just a little bit. So the agenda might look like this. Uh, we would make a presentation. We would go through the 2017 High School Feasibility Study. Uh, we would have an opportunity then for some feedback. We would go through the 2019 district-wide facilities master plan and specifically the conditions assessment. We would do actual real-time survey and polling of all the participants, and we'll show you that in a moment. And then I think one of the coolest things about this is that, as you can imagine, community engagement at that point, everybody has heard so much information, they haven't had the opportunity to speak and they need to talk it out. We're gonna send them into individual roundtable rooms to have that opportunity. We'll unmute them. Each one of those rooms will be facilitated by an administrator or a Fanning Howie representative or somebody that will be listening and we'll give them a sp specific task to discuss in that 15 minute plus or minus breakout period. We'll bring everybody back into the room. We'll have the facilitator from each one of the round tables uh, report out so everybody can hear, okay, so table one said this, and so forth. Uh, we'll, out, we'll outline next steps such as calendar, next meetings, and so forth, and then we'll thank everybody for their participation. Okay, so let's jump in. So, uh, then we would move into the presentation mode, and again, as I outlined, uh, we start with the original high school feasibility study. So I think you're all familiar with this particular document. Uh, again, I'm just going to summarize at this point. I'm not going to go through this. You all had lots of time to look at this. You're very familiar with this. But clearly what we would want everybody to understand, sort of bring them back, because it's been a couple of years since there's been a presentation uh, as to the purpose for that feasibility study. And that outline is... So what we found was the high schools were challenged to support 21st century programs and curriculum delivery. Uh, capacity uh, was not there necessary for the programming. Overutilization, limited flexibility. Uh, one of the important things that you ask us to do is benchmark your high schools against other high-performing high schools throughout Indiana. And so we found in many categories, 
uh, whether it was the types of spaces, the technology, other key things that are important to you, uh, you were below those benchmarks. And the overall condition was generally unsatisfactory. And I want to be specific again. As we talked about before, this is not, this is not a question of maintenance. You're doing a great job of maintaining your buildings. But as the next slide illustrates, most high-performing high schools undergo major remodeling at a 15-year interval and then major renovations at 25 to 30 years. You are clearly at, in fact, some cases beyond that 30-year interval. So the study findings demonstrated that significant improvements need to be made at the three high schools. And you may also recall, because the campus is combined with both West Vigo High School and Middle School, we added the middle school into this study. So again, we want to make sure and not fatigue folks. So at this point, uh, let's talk about well, what is a 21st century? What are features that are important to a 21st century high school? And so this is, this is what we call annotation. Uh, sometimes we'll also call it heat map in a face-to-face -face community engagement. We might have images of different types of spaces up on the wall. We give everybody stickers and let them vote. Oh, this is really important. This is important. And maybe uh, this is not as important. Well, we have the opportunity to do that here. So here would be a case where we bring up the next slide. And these might be features that you would consider important in 21st century high schools. Uh, and I'm not going to read all of those. Uh, you can see them. But they cover the gamut. Uh, and we give folks the opportunity to apply their stickers to the ones. We'll give them three stickers and give them the opportunity to vote on what they think are the most important aspects of a 21st century high school. Uh, this is not to say that anyone is not important. But again, this is a way in which we help to you to start to see the value that the community, your community, places on these types of spaces. And we can do this in a number of different ways, using these images, uh, again, as a way to allow uh, the participants to interact. And we can actually see them as they're placing their stickers or their check marks or hearts on each one of those images. So then we'll come back and we'll talk about the phase one condition assessment. OK, so what actually have we done so far in the master plan? Well, we've gone out and visited all the buildings. Let's jump right into the uh, description of those activities. So collected existing drawings and information for all of your 32 school and support facilities. Uh, we reviewed and collated all that information. And then the most important thing that we did is, as teams of architects and engineers, we went to each one of those sites. We met with administrative leadership on site, both to share what we saw, as well as get their input on what they saw as the current condition and needs for each one of those buildings. And we are combining and assembling all that information in an assessment of all the facilities and we'll follow up here with a, an initial format that we're using for that. OK, so there's a <laughs> lot of material. So if you wanted to know when each one of your school facilities was built, if you want to know what the enrollment trends are, if you want to know the square footage, the area, uh, the uh, acreage, and so forth, there's a lot of detail here that people can drill down in and see for each one of your facilities. Uh, the other piece that then would be also shown would be the actual condition assessments that were made for each one of the facilities, which we're not in a position yet to finalize and unveil. But this would be a, a piece of information that we provide. Other information we would provide would be energy usage of each one of the buildings, uh, other types of statistical information that's really important as you're contemplating uh, what is the best approach to uh, continue to maintain to improve your facilities. But one of the key factors is the high school condition assessment. So as you're aware from that original feasibility study, uh, that, was, that was quite an in-depth document. There was a lot of information there. But time changes over several years. And so we took that as sort of a baseline. We went back and met with administrative leadership at each one of the campuses and reviewed and identified changes that had been made, just like you've been doing some geobond work that Dr. Hayworth discussed tonight that you acted upon. Some of that work's been ongoing, so clearly if that's done, that's not an issue. Uh, but again, these are large facilities with a 
lot of square footage there. And so, again, as you pass that interval we talked about of 30 years, uh, conditions continue to deteriorate, and not because you're letting them go, it's simply because systems and materials and finishes and so forth, they've met their useful life. And so even though you maintain them in a clean and sanitary condition, they no longer support your programming as best they could. So here's a tool, I'm sorry, and I got ahead of myself. So here's one way that we have looked at the eight concepts that we talked about. So the concepts are one through eight, reading from left to right. <laughs> Just quickly, the legend is red, blue, and a dashed area. But the red suggests renovation. The blue suggests new construction. And the dashed area suggests areas that would be demolished, decommissioned and demolished at each one of the sites. And as you can see, if we move from left to right, we have more renovation on the left and less or even no renovation on the right. When we did the high school feasibility study, you may recall from the presentation, we started out with the first three concepts one through three. Concept one, very simply stated, is a major renovation of each one of the three campuses, some selective demolition, and some selective new areas to be constructed that are needed in each one of the campuses. Concept number two, you may recall, we called that reconstruction, as we use that term. And what that meant was we had much more demolition and replacement with new construction at each one of the sites and some renovation. By the way, each one of these, although they're not very, they're not totally accurate, they are sort of illustrative in that they, the sizes are correct, if you will. So you'll notice in the next one, for instance, uh, this would be a new replacement entirely on each one of the campuses. Obviously, West Vigo High School Middle School campus is a smaller population, a smaller building, and so you can see that blue square is actually a little bit smaller. The board asked us to explore additional concepts, and so concept four was added, and the idea there was, what if there was a new East Vigo High School, and that we replaced the other three buildings uh, that right-sized them to distribute the enrollment? And so that's what concept four represents. Concept number five, you can see there's a really big blue block there. That would be a new Terre Haute high, Big Oak High School that would combine north and south in a single building and then replace all the buildings on West Campus. Concept, sorry, six, <laughs> got out of order. Concept six would be the construction of a single new Terre Haute High School on either North or South Campus, and then the decommissioning, demolition of all other buildings, and then we would build back a new West Vigo Middle School. Concept seven is very similar, except we would go and find a, an entirely new site to build that single high school, decommission, demolish the other buildings, build a new West Vigo Middle School. And then finally, concept eight, which was requested to be analyzed, is to build out two larger high schools, north and south, decommissioned West Vigo High School, build a new West Vigo Middle School. So again, these are the eight concepts that are under consideration that we would be presenting additional information in detail in the community engagement sessions and then asking folks questions now. We don't want to handcuff the board by asking people to vote straight up or down which one you like. What we're interested in is what do you value? So we spend a great deal of time looking into the survey questions that we're going to ask. We find that 20 to 25 questions is just about the point where fatigue starts to set in. It's, it's novel at first, uh, it's fun, people are amazed at the participants and their actual feelings as, as to the questions we ask, and then at some point at about 25, okay, enough of this, I have something to say. We'll get to that. So let's jump right into the uh, survey. So my teammates will be answering, as well as Doug has the opportunity, since he was invited into the conference, he'll get the answer. So one of the things we know is that oftentimes patrons don't really know what the conditions are. So we ask a series of demographic questions to get a sense of whether they're familiar with the buildings or not. 
And one of those ways is, do they have children that have attended or not? Now, Megan is host can actually see. She knows how many people are in the conference. She can watch and tally how many votes are taken, so we don't have to wait forever. We know when we get to 95% or even 100% vote tally, we'll bring up the results. Okay, another demographic question that we might ask is, did you attend uh, any of the high schools? Uh, again, we want to get a sense of where they're coming from, what they value, what how are they envisioning the high school projects? Um, so again, we'll give everybody the opportunity, Megan, we'll evaluate that, and then as soon as we see everybody voted, we'll bring that up. There are a couple different demographic questions that we ask, and so again, we would fine tune those with administration so everybody's very comfortable with them. Okay, and then the third one would be just point blank, when's the last time that you were in one of the Vigo County high schools? And again, the results of this may help us to determine we need to have more open houses at the high schools, for, specifically for the purpose, as you've done before, to see the conditions and do tours. Okay, so that's not the only thing that we ask folks. Again, we're looking for value here without specifically voting straight up on any option. So these are just a couple of examples. So uh, because we know there's a question, can renovations truly get us to a point of having a 21st century high school experience for our students? So let's ask them a qualitative question. Do you believe after seeing the presentation and the features that could be incorporated, for instance, either concept one or two? Do you believe that that would be a satisfactory result? Agree, strongly agree, all the way down to strongly disagree. So again, we didn't ask them to vote on a concept, we asked them to vote in terms of what they value and what they perceive. Another way we can ask these questions are, well, this I think this one is really important. I believe that any improvements to Vigo County High Schools should result in maintaining the three separate high schools. Again, you still have options as a board as to which one of those uh, concepts solves this, this issue, but you get a sense of whether there's a, a temperament for consideration of consolidation or not. Okay, so, yes, Dr. Avery. This be mindful of our time. Okay, good, so we'll just wrap up here real quickly. Okay, so again, like I said, after 20, 25 questions, everybody is ready to speak. And so then we do round table discussion, so Megan, She's already taken a look. She knows that we have 150 folks. We want to have between five and eight people in each one of the round tables. Uh, we can do this randomly. So it's not like any group can gang up on a particular facilitator in a room. They'll just be sent to a room, so let's do that. Okay, so we're going into breakout room two. So we're with Mary and with Megan and Zach. So, uh, an administrator or ourselves or somebody would be facilitating the discussion and the question would be what do you think again we want to have we want to give them a specific uh, charge in this case we would ask them what do you think are the five most important features that would make for a successful project at our high schools in terms of features within the building and that would give them enough meat to, to chew on and discuss and our facilitator would be keeping track of So we will you not be, Zach? what's that? What's that, Mary? I was just asking Zach what he thought. Okay. Well, I, I, we have a time limit here. I have many thoughts. Go ahead. So we'll have that discussion internally, and in a moment here, we're going to get a pop-up message that's going to say returning to the main room in, in however many seconds. And again, this is all under, this is all under control of Megan's control. Leaving that breakout room. So again, we we predetermined based upon the number of participants how many breakout rooms we have, and people just automatically go there and back. So it's, it's very intuitive. We're not asking them to do a lot of interaction, to do a lot of. Uh, uh, they don't have to manipulate their computer a lot. It's, it's very very simple, very intuitive. Um, so after the roundtable discussion, we'll do roundtable uh, 
there was a question, we'll report out very quickly, give each one of the tables a minute. We'll wrap things up. Next steps, you know, we can outline calendar, dates, other opportunities. Uh, if we do record this, now we can't do the survey in the recording, obviously, but then we can set up like a survey monkey or something like that so folks could watch and then they can go take the survey. Another important demographic question we often ask is, have you participated in any one of the surveys? Because we don't want ballot box stuffing, so to speak, so we want to know how many people have participated once or twice. That's not unusual, and we can, we can know that as well. So then we'll thank everybody for their participation. And uh, again, uh, we want to keep the questions consistent so we can aggregate them in total so you can see the total results of that. Again, we're, we're ready to go if you think this is appropriate. We're, we're very confident. We have a, a number of our clients that are looking at this seriously as a way to continue their dialogue on their potential project. Any questions? Pretty cool. Thank you. Can you do a hybrid and you do a physical meeting while you're also doing a virtual meeting? Yes. Yes, we could. Now, I say that very quickly, and I'm not the technologist here, so the question would be, for the folks that are in the audience, how would they input into that real-time survey? But I'm pretty confident our, our group could figure that one out. They may actually be, they may actually be participating on their phone. So I, I could have brought up my phone right now and been in the Zoom conference if I wanted to. Bill, can you tell us how many people are following us right now? Uh, 105. There's 105 people right now that are attending this meeting virtually. Our last meeting, Bill, how many total views of that meeting do you know? Total views is over 4,000. So if there's some lessons to be learned in regards to COVID-19 and community participation, I think we uh, were appreciative of the efforts of Fannie and Howie to assist us in trying to create a dynamic that uh, seems to be appealing to uh, the greater community. When was the last time you attended a board meeting where there were 100 people physically in the boardroom or 4,000 people that viewed a video of the, I mean, I think, thank you for helping us get to this point. We do believe that there's still a place for in-person meetings, but given the situation, we're very thankful for you and your team this for us. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thanks, team. You can sign off now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. We appreciate your time and effort putting that together and presenting it to us tonight. You're welcome. Moving on, we will have our second call. And I noticed that we did not have a first call because it was not on the agenda. I did not skip it. So our second call, which is our first call, uh, for citizen comments, this can be on anything except personnel. Uh, it's just a reminder, you do have a five minute limit. Uh, anybody has anything to say? Good evening, President Ir Irwin, um, Superintendent Hayworth, and members of the Board of Trustees. My name is Leo Myers. I had two comments from tonight's meeting. First, I want to applaud the idea of a $10 million um, award for a renovation for Otter Creek Middle School. This is something that has been talked about for many years, and I think it's well overdue. And the other comment that I have is, will these presentations be available on the website for people to view? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. That would be our intent. Any others this evening? Seeing none, anything from the board or the superintendent? Uh, I have three items. Do you want me to go ahead? We haven't really had any committee meetings except for the finance committee, so go ahead. Uh, the first is uh, the continued discussion on sex education. We will be establishing uh, work session meetings on June the 29th. July 6th in the evening and July 7th in the evening with more information to follow. 
Next, today we launched a parent survey that speaks to the return to school. And we are encouraging parents to participate in that survey. The survey's been out since early this afternoon. And we have how many people that have completed the survey to this point? 5,700. So again, showing the power of technology and digital uh, formats. Uh, very thankful, but we still need to hear from more as we try to gather information on the return to school. The last thing that uh, I would have is a, a proposed amendment uh, to the agreement uh, for the sale of the administration building. It's a very small amendment but much needed. And the amendment, the amendment is for the closing date. The amendment would read, the parties agree to amend section 1.2 of the agreement to remove the reference to June 15, 2020 and provide the closing date shall be no later than the diligent expiration date. Excuse me. Closing date shall be no later than the date which is 15 days following the due diligence expiration date, which due diligence expiration date is hereby designated as July 6, 2020, and not June 15, 2020. The closing date uh, shall be a date selected by agreement of the buyer and seller, but shall be no later than July 20th, 2020. Seeking approval for that small change in the agreement. I move to approve. Second. Mrs. Lauer made the motion to approve. Mr. Lockhart seconded that. And again, this is just a change in date, nothing else. So, a pretty minor change. Thank you. Mr. Irwin? Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Ms. Lauer? Aye. Dr. Powers? Aye. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Burks? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hayward. Anything else for the good of the cause? Yes, Board? indeed. Okay. So I'm sorry, Paul. Uh, I, I just want to comment that uh, I think we owe a great appreciation to our ministry staff and all those who helped to set us up over here. exciting and very helpful to us as, as we move forward but it does take a lot of work to do this but then it also helps I think that we model what we're going to be asking our staff and students to do and then I also wanted to uh, well, Dr. Hayworth do you mind commenting on uh, uh, not the specifics but the fact that, that you're doing some uh, conferencing with leaders of the various employee groups yes to gather information I think that's not, not only are we, we serving our parents, and thank you, Mr. Lockhart, uh, we have set up uh, meetings with all employee groups, and we're asking the head of each employee group to be speaking to their members uh, to gather information really in regards to their concerns as we look to return. These would be bus drivers, custodians, secretarial, educational assistants, cafeteria, and the list would go on and on, teachers. Um, as you think about the protection and safety of our students, that's just one part of the equation. You know, how do we return our staff uh, to school in situations where they feel safe and secure in the delivery of education? And so we have started that process and we'll continue that process and we'll continue it even through when school even starts. Um, 
So uh, thank you, Mr. Lockhart. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something else you were going to say before that? Okay. Yeah, just our, our next board meeting, July the 13th. I'll work with the board, but I would hope that this location could also serve for our next board meeting as well. Seeing nothing else, we will hopefully see you back here on July 13th here in this room. And we thank you guys for being here, and we will see you July 13th. Thank you.